Welcome back, guys, to the Beyond Condition podcast, where today we have the elusive, well, not so elusive, VIP guest, Joe Jeffrey, back on the pod. And it's super, super cool to have you back on this episode because it's the first episode of season two, and you actually kicked off season one, the first episode with me, way back in January 22. So thank you, my friend, for coming back on. Thank you, Sarah. It's an honour to kick off the season again. I know we did quite a few good episodes. If you guys haven't heard any of them, there were some featuring me and Josh McHale as well. They were, I think they were pretty informative. I can't remember if we ever covered like anabolics or androgens in general. I know that we did a lot of female PED talk. I can't remember if we ever went down that line. Even if we did, it, it would be good for us to give a kind of basic rundown on having a practical understanding of them and what they do and why you might choose to use them and stuff in this one. Cause I know you said you wanted to talk about Prima Boland specifically. And I think we can get to that probably down a line of explaining androgens in general. And then why would we want to talk about Primo, you know? Yeah, for sure. And when we did the episodes last year, it was basically to get the education out there for people about, the safer use model in inverted commas and to up the awareness of you know if you go down that route what the implications are because like we both have that passion for getting a bit more information out there especially to female competitors so that it clears the air I guess and the questions that they might have and may not have anyone to ask those questions to yeah absolutely and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on educating female PED users. I had a consult this week with a woman that had used Anavar, so an anabolic androgenic steroid, for five years just straight, um, which works. Well, it does the job, but th- there's more risk-aversive ways for females to use performance-enhancing drugs that can still bring about very, very good outcomes without having to go down that line. And maybe in this podcast, I'll explain to people why that's probably not a good idea for most women. You know. yeah for sure I don't think again like you say there's not that much out there in regards to a lot more work needing to be done the effects of you know the different type of compounds that you can use and the especially the virilization and what can happen off the back of using certain compounds and the irreversible effects of that like you know we've said before it's crazy if you get to that point and it's like shit what do I do now yeah, not a lot, unfortunately, without just paying more costs. So, okay, cool. Let's talk about anabolic steroids then, anabolic androgenic steroids, and then we can eventually get to Primo because I think the, the background in a practical understanding really helps people understand what these drugs do and then why you might choose one over the other or something like that. So if we go right back nearly a century to the synthesis of testosterone. As you know, that's a it's a bioidentical hormone. It's an endogenous hormone. So that's a hormone that is in both men and women. It's the most abundant sex steroid hormone in females. So, you know, testosterone isn't something to necessarily be feared by females. Um, the problem occurs with the medical use, the clinical deployment of testosterone in that in the doses that you may require to fix the disease state or whatever it is you're dealing with there's an androgenic consequence Mm -hmm. so you can think of these molecules as all having uh, androgenicity and anabolism so anabolism would be associated with some of the things that we like like protein accretion growth of new contractile tissue right or or retaining uh, protein tissue so retaining skeletal muscle in a deficit or a larger deficit than you would be able to uh, previously or something like that so that's all the good stuff that we like to use these drugs for we want from these drugs on the androgenicity side of things there's the things that we don't like growth of terminal body hair or clitoral enlargement or voice deepening so for people that are considered androgen sensitive like women or the elderly or in some cases children you, you can't use 70 milligrams of testosterone, 200 milligrams of testosterone or something without paying a really large cost of androgenicity. So since the synthesis of testosterone, various pharmaceutical companies have made manipulations to the testosterone molecule and other molecules um, 
the, the, the most common one that we would discuss in female androgen use would be dihydrotestosterone. So again, dihydrotestosterone is an endogenous molecule. It occurs when testosterone interacts with the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. Dihydrotestosterone in and of itself isn't anabolic. It's broken down by an enzyme in skeletal muscle called 3-alpha hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. You don't need to know that. Um, <laughs> but, um, but that's important to know because, you know, DHT, the dihydrotestosterone DHT isn't anabolic in and of itself. But there are molecules that scientists have uh, derived from DHT that are anabolic. And there are sort of theories out there, hypotheses that, you know, uh, Primo doesn't build muscle well because um, DHT doesn't, because it gets broken down by the, the 3-AHSD enzyme when that's not the case. Um, but anyway, so... From a basic view, scientists manipulate the testosterone and the dihydrotestosterone molecule and other molecules like when we discuss nandrolones and things like that, but I don't think that's important for our discussion here, to basically retain the anabolic properties of testosterone. So per milligram, they are supposed to be as anabolic as testosterone, and it turns out they pretty much all are just about as anabolic as testosterone, but they remove as much androgenicity as they can. And over the years, better options have become available with less androgenic consequence in total, but just as anabolic as testosterone. And then also, in some circumstances, more tissue selective. So maybe uh, they would only interact with, in a perfect world, androgen receptors in skeletal muscle. And this is where you get into steroidal SARMs, selective androgen receptor modulators like primobolin, Anovar, Mastron, Trembolone. These are all steroidal SARMs. And then the more up-to-date current research being on non-steroidal signs like RAD140 and Osterine and things like that. Um, so something that is as tissue selective as possible and as least androgenic as possible, but retains the anabolism per milligram of testosterone is going to be the best choice, definitely for women. And to be honest, in most cases, probably for men as well, you know, we don't want to pay additional androgenic consequence if we can just get pure raw protein accretion, pure raw muscle growth, you know, that sounds way better. The problem is, as until, or, or even up to now, or ahead of now, I don't know when this day will be, we haven't been able to remove androgenicity entirely. So there, there is still androgenic consequence to the use of these molecules, albeit far less than testosterone, there is still androgenic consequence. So with sufficient dosing, so, you know, if you use enough of it and with a sufficient duration of time, so if you use them for a long period of time, there is an androgenic cost to pay. Worth mentioning that duration seems to play a greater cost than dose, but of course, general recommendations would be to use as little as possible for a short time possible. Um, and as we go through these molecules, like I said, these are basically various pharmaceutical companies like competing for who can make the, the best molecule. You know, they, they don't differ that greatly. Like Anavar, Masteron, Primobolin, they're all DHT derivatives. They're all derived from dihydrotestosterone. So, you know, these scientists make these manipulations to the molecule to take androgenicity out of stuff. Um, in terms of androgenic consequence per milligram, it does seem by the research that primobolin is the least androgenic that we have. Um, Mastron's up there as well. People say things like Mastron's basically pure DHT. It's like super androgenic. It's not. It's not. That, that's nonsense. I think what people might be confusing that with is Mastron's interaction with like the epidermal growth factor receptor, this is a whole other podcast, but that's something that can drive contractile force output quite heavily, which is why strength athletes tend to gravitate towards mastron. But in terms of androgenicity, it's certainly far less androgenic than testosterone and also less androgenic than nandrolone. NPP seems to be making a resurgence, which is nandrolone phenylpropionate. Uh, that's just the ester attached to the nandrolone molecule. That There are women that use NPP for whatever reason that there's no reason for a female bodybuilding athlete to ever use nandrolone there's, there's better options such as masteron or anabar or your best option based on what we currently know if your goal is to minimize androgenicity is certainly prima bola. you could make the argument that you know if, if you're only going to use like 
five milligrams a day for four weeks once a year it, yeah it's probably not a big deal whether you choose anabar master on primo you know you're probably not going to pay anabolic consequence there mm -hmm. if you're a figure competitor physique competitor and you use 150 to 300 milligrams of androgens a week for 20 weeks of the year like maybe your whole prep yeah you, you need to start thinking about these things if you care about virilization because some women don't give a shit which is fine yeah you know that's sure there's many women you know I, I watched every single female class at the olympia this year i was forced to by the way before anybody thinks i'm sad i saw it on your story and i thought he's very invested this year <laughs> well i watched i watched all the classes that i have um interesting competing in uh, npc classes so like i have to watch wellness i have to watch bikini i have to watch figure i don't have any women's physique uh ifbb competitors um yeah. So I have to keep up with what's going on there. But, you know, Jazz is there, Ryan. What shoes does she have on? What colours her hair? What colours the bikini? <laughs> and you're there till four in the morning going, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can't look at I've always said, though, like the female bodybuilding class, for me, I look at that class and I'm like, this is fucking unreal. It's so cool to watch. Yeah, one of the things I was so excited for with Wings of Strength taking over the Olympia was the re-emergence of women's bodybuilding. I love women's bodybuilding. It's insane. The freakiest physique to me is the most interesting to see. Like, yeah, so, and that's like, like you say, you know, some people don't give a shit about virilization. And even mm. from the start, when I first started as a bodybuilder, little skinny bikini athlete, newbie, I was like, these women are fucking so cool. And I have admiration for that because if you want to go down that path and you know the consequences, then why fucking not? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's worth mentioning there as well that those women are one in 10 million genetically structured already. And then you add lots of drugs for lots of time and lots of perfect adherence to training and stress and sleep management and nutrition. And yeah. then only 1% of that group get there. Looking at those women and thinking, right, I can anabolics myself there. What? often happens and i've seen it happen many times it's really sad is a load of heavy virilization to become like a, a a pretty good regional competitor and then inevitably they quit and then they're kind of a normal physique but heavily virilized female mm. you, you're essentially putting yourself through hormonally mediated gender reassignment and then just like looking normal so it's it's always a good idea to minimize androgen consequence right and you're not going to bodybuild forever you know, yeah. I mean, I wish we could. Hopefully we can. I know some, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I was going to say Matt Adams, but he isn't old and decrepit. He's <laughs> but, older, isn't he? And he's still going for it, you know? He's, he's the same age as my dad, and he's still in here training hard. He simply is checking today, you know? He's he's still doing this thing, and it's keeping him young. I've, I know loads of examples like that. Um, but are they still going to be competing when they're 60, 70? M maybe not. And for a female, like, if you want to, maybe have a family when you're 35 and you know you don't want to be heavily virilized when you want to just look normal in society without your muscular shell so yeah. to speak mm -hmm. um i mean i'm making assumptions I, mean, no, let's just say effect, I think it's important though because you know like if you're if there's someone listening that's early 20s and they bodybuilding is their whole focus you don't necessarily think of where you're going to be when you're age 40 or like you say 35 mm -hmm. and if you were to go down the non-educated route of you know taking whatever peds you it may affect you having children at 35 or or the rest of your life most definitely great point yeah so the hpo axes negative feedback that you'll get from using androgens is most definitely going to be a potential deleterious input to your future ability to be fertile you know just like primary amenorrhea that you would get in a contest prep when your your own endogenous hormonal cycle stops um the same thing is going to happen if you use a sufficient level of these drugs. And I don't want people to confuse sufficient with like loads. No, like pretty normal bikini dosing of Anavar or Primo or, or Masteroid will put you in that position. And you compound that with chronic dieting and uh, extremely low levels of body fat and stuff like that. Like it's not looking good for your fertility. And you definitely want to do that for as short duration as possible and get your own normal hormonal cycle rolling through so I with my female competitors I tend to set a rule with four normal hormonal cycles minimum between competitive seasons oh nice um, as a future consideration if we can't reinstate HPO axis function which when I say that I'm essentially talking about your own function of testosterone 
luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, estradiol, progesterone. If we can't get that looking pretty normal, then you know we've got a problem, and, and you don't want to you know prep from there. You got a worse problem. You know. Yeah, sure. Hey, you know my own experience of having no menstrual cycle for six years um, mm. when I was natty, and then my period just came back on Christmas Eve, so it took like two months to come back this time around. So it's come back so much quicker being down the assisted route that's the only you know big change as such so I'm like when I was like oh my god my period's back um and it's a celebration isn't it it's like this is the first sign of health <laughs> yeah well hormonally because you use exogenous testosterone don't you as well yeah yeah right so you know you, you if you didn't you would be coming out of a show because you got incredibly lean you'd be coming out of there with no testosterone and no estrogen um you know, extremely unhealthy. It would have taken a good period of time of reinstatement of like collateral fattening, like you'd have to gain body fat quickly, maybe even beyond your pre-prep point. That's pretty normal just to get normal function. And this is, I mean, this is probably a whole nother podcast topic, but the, the role of hormone replacement therapy for females, something that can't be, can't be overstated in its importance for people that compete frequently literally like for me it's been a night and day difference how I felt during the prep of course I dug a lot more than I have in previous preps but you know it was a night and day difference to, for the majority of the prep from the start to sort of I guess two-thirds of the way through of how I felt in myself and having that pop-up of test having the t3 t4 all of these things to keep me as hormonally sound as possible yeah t3 t4 is another example you know, because having subclinical levels of testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, T3, T4, we know that's associated with negative health outcomes like inflammation, insulin resistance, increases in multiple disease risks. And if you're a natural competitor, don't for one second, please think that it's healthy to diet like that. Uh, and there's no, and unfortunately, there's no way to avoid it. Like it's happening if you're getting that lean, yeah. just to be there for as little time as possible. But that's one of the the very few times that using drugs can be safer and just using a like a true replacement dose like just put yourself in a really nice spot of the physiological range of all of these hormones and you will be attenuating at least some of the negative health costs of a contest prep also like we said before if you use anabar or, or masteron or prima bono or, or any of these drugs in uh you know appreciable dosages that that will also turn off your own sex steroid hormone function so you wouldn't want to use those ideally without a base of testosterone either. Yeah, yeah. And with Primo, so I had six weeks exposure in prep to when we were getting closer to the show to essentially hold on to some fullness. And mm -hmm. I went straight in on 70 and the option was 35. But Tom said, let's just go in with the 70. And then we dropped it back. I like it. Just double the dose, man. Mm, we you doubled it we go 35 forget that we go 70 <laughs> we dropped it back down because it was like actually i think it's gone too far the other way i went back to the 35 and then i'm actually starting um by the time this episode goes live i'm starting the next six week exposure to primo but obviously in a, a building phase yeah, so you've just put out some really good kind of general guidelines there. I mean, Tom is an excellent coach and he knows this shit really well. So that's the reason why you, your stuff is planned and periodized so well is because you've got a great coach who learned from the best. No, I'm not going to say that. Um, you know, <laughs> the king, <laughs> the Joe Jeffrey. Gonna, um, so, in fact, let's wind it back. Let's wind it back. So we, we, we've we've come to where Prima Bolin is. Like this is just as anabolic as testosterone or any other anabolic androgenic steroid to date all research like when you compare the Hirschberger assay and various human trials they're all around about as anabolic as each other as you raise the dosage right in low in very low doses you see some things with great discrepancy when you raise the dose most things lose tissue selectivity and they're just about as anabolic as each other so cool we also know that it's removed a good deal of the androgenicity but not all of it so what is it doing? So Primo Bolum binds to the androgen receptor. All androgens bind here. This is what we would call like a classical genomic uh, response or expression. Um, there are other sites that other anabolics bind to, like the glucocorticoid receptor, or like we said earlier, um, the epidermal growth factor receptor. Um, really the only one we're interested in here, the only main interaction point for something like Primo Bolum or Anavar 
or masteron is the androgen receptor. So it binds at the androgen receptor and like transcribes anabolism. So it turns on lots of cool stuff that leads to pushing up muscle protein synthesis, basically. So you've got the protein turnover equation per day. You, muscle protein synthesis is going to be pushed up X amount via your protein feedings, via your resistance training, things like that. And then muscle protein breakdown is going to be pushed up a certain degree as well by your calorie deficit or your resistance training, to give another example, or whatever. Loads of stuff can push muscle protein breakdown on super high stress, cortisol, muscle protein breakdown, so, you know. So within that balance, you, and if you want to gain muscle, it has to skew like this. Muscle protein synthesis has to be higher than breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, and how hard we can skew that ratio will determine in a very basic schema how much muscle you can grow in a single day week month whatever so we, we can push muscle protein synthesis up and in some cases we can push muscle protein breakdown down there are drugs with anti-catabolic properties as well like clenbuterol i think we've already gone through that in another podcast yeah. like trem trembolone specifically has interactions with the glucocorticoid receptor that push down muscle protein breakdown which is what makes it such a a useful molecule for dieting. I'm not recommending trembolone to women, although it was traditionally prescribed to women um, with sarcopenia. That's what its original human deployment was. It's a potent steroidal SARM. I think in relative dosages, it, it would be safe for a female to use, but it sounds almost sacrilegious as a coach to talk about trembolone. And George, said actually, this actually. George I said did it. He came on the pod. He was like, yeah, it's a bit of a gray area. <laughs> another great coach that knows his shit George. oh god uh, he always credits you of course because he says he learned from the oh, best yeah. it's been super cool to get him on the pod as well from a different angle of you know some of the mental health associated with steroids as well but like you say really yeah. good coach. oh yeah well his career in the last year has been a beautiful thing to watch just go yeah you know. love it because i started mentoring george well, we got we got to be coming up on three years because I was still living in my old house then, um, and especially in the last year, you know, I put him in touch with Dean and Lizzie because I know they had a position available, and then it it just all went through really nicely, and he's just blown in his in his career and his own progress so well. And yeah, and his ability as a coach. Mm, yeah, because we when he came on the pod, um, I think he's come on a few times now, but I think it was the second or third time. And actually had a female competitor that he'd helped out with the advice about PEDs. And she was like, he pretty much saved my life. And it's and she listens to the podcast. And it's this type of thing Very we're cool. actually trying. It's it's a big thing, like this this advice yeah. and getting the awareness out. We've got more female competitors than ever. Mm -hmm. Um and unfortunately, there's still a lot of very traditional practices based on lack of knowledge or based on this is how it's always been done but we know better now and coaches should always be i know this is not relevant to the podcast but something i press with guys like george and what he's done so well like if you're not dedicating at least a couple hours a day of your working day to learning more then you're falling behind you're not doing your due diligence properly so this is an educational segment i suppose um sure. okay cool so prima bolin at the androgen receptor, turning on loads of cool stuff that pushes muscle protein synthesis up. Mm -hmm. So in a dieting phase, it's going to allow you to retain more tissue, maybe even build tissue if you skew protein turnover to that degree. Uh, in, in advanced athletes, probably not, depending on the size of the deficit, but potentially, you know, this is well shown in research that novice uh, exposees you could say people that haven't used anabolics before when they are exposed they generally lose muscle they don't lose muscle they, they generally build muscle and lose body fat so you can skew the protein turnover equation to that degree i don't think that should necessarily be a goal and i think the dosage is needed to do that in an advanced competitor and you should be advanced if you're considering these molecules anyway would be deleterious there's also some cosmetic effects that happen through various inputs that can be quite complicated such as skewing the androgen to estrogen ratio so you add prima bolum which is an androgen that has no estrogenic consequence so your blood androgen estrogen ratio moves more in favor of androgens and that skews things like the compartmentalization of fluid so whether you hold fluid extracellularly interstitially like under the skin or whether you hold it intramuscularly intracellularly you know um so you can get that's what people say it makes me look drier it doesn't actually dry you out your fluid balance doesn't change 
um, it just there's more presence of that hydration intracellularly. And if you have very little body fat, then the cellular space that's available for partitioning is the muscle cell, right? Um, and there's interactions with aldosterone and things like that that bring general fluid retention down also, depending on what other drugs you use. So we've basically got this molecule that will increase the ability to build muscle, will increase the ability to retain tissue, and will improve your cosmetic effects to a degree, to the degree necessary, which is a great uh, mention for competitors. Most female competitors are bikini. And anybody that watched the Bikini Olympia this year, they know they're not extremely heavily muscled. Mm. Um, so how much drug do you need? How much muscle are you trying to build? You know, like probably you, you don't need to add 10 pounds of tissue. I mean, maybe you're doing your whole career, but you, yeah. don't, you don't need a big drug load for that. And they're also not coming in really dry for the most part. The look that's favoured seems to change and wax and wane over the years. This year, especially, they didn't seem to really... Um, favor that it's hard it's hard as a coach to follow that trust me um, oh, it's hard as a competitor as well i'm like i don't have a fucking clue <laughs> yeah you're right they're, they're going for this this year and, and this judge is on there and he was on that panel let's go for that and the feedback so i know coming more like this like my it god is, it's, just... it's very hard like but you said as well i remember you mentioning on a pod before even with wellness with carol the exposure to drugs you'd think would potentially be much higher when you look at a wellness physique proper wellness physique actually mm. it's similar to a bikini athlete oh it's for me and for my wellness girls it's it's been pretty much exactly the same if not slightly less in some cases but we're back to the genetic card like carol's a freak look at oh, her, so cool. her structure you know like she'd probably look mental having never lifted away in her life yes know? Yeah, and that goes back to what you said earlier, actually, um, which is a really good thing that you mentioned, that these, you know, the female bodybuilding, the Olympia athletes, the, the genetic makeup, but they also have their nutrition, their training, their sleep, their recovery, all nailed. And I think that ties into as well PEDs, you know, if you're going down this route, at least have other things nailed first to then go into this route. You know what I mean? Yeah, and like... Before you get into this, take a real honest assessment of yourself and your genetic capabilities as well. But I'll give, I can give a few examples, right? In fact, I'll give three examples of people that all use around about the same drug use. Would they mind? Me? No, I can't say two of them actually. Right. <laughs> but, right. I'll, I'll use one of them. Use one of them. So Sarah Bradley, right? Yep. Love Sarah to death. She's an incredible athlete. She writes a drug use on Instagram. I promise you, some people are looking at that and going, no way. No, she can't do She can't do that little. Look at her before she ever used drugs. Look at her structure, her insertions, her muscle bellies. She looks like a physique athlete that could transition to bodybuilding anyway. Yeah. All right. Now, if I took my wife and yeah. said, right, we're going to get you into figure. I, you know, that she would be jazz man pretty quickly. You know, it, <laughs> it's so true though, because I don't think sometimes people actually put thought into that. I know a lot of people that go, oh, I want to do figure, but they're at that point, their body, their makeup is su more suitable for bikini. But it's like mm -hmm. they they feel they have the right to, I, I don't mean that in any other way, but you know, you've got to go with what your body suits. And we've had this conversation about myself. Mm. Yeah. So you're super bikini. Mm. If you push to wellness, you're a tough one because I, I can see the wellness inkling coming through with more tissue and your drug exposure is so low that uh, I, it, it might just be like, right, three year plan. That's pretty safe for someone like you. Yeah. You know, I think you're, you're a difficult case actually. Yeah. But someone like Emma Thackeray, for example, you know, my client Emma, she just won Miss Nabba, uh, sorry, Miss Universe Nabba figure. Like her exposure was less than yours. Really? So, yeah. I, I promise you. No, I mean, and if you, you know, looked at her, you know, when I look, I think she is wham. And if you didn't know anything yeah. about PEDs and you were coming into bodybuilding and you look at that, you'd, be, you'd assume, like you always say, that people are on higher doses. Yeah. Uh, and another thing about Emma is she's not virilized at all. Mm. She's got no virilization, which is a result of her behaviors. You know, we, we said from the get go, we, that's not a cost. She's actually in a position now where the, the girls that are beating her are quite a bit more muscular. And we did have a chance saying, no, it's not. It's, it's not worth going to that degree. We'll just keep coming in absolutely peeled, put a little bit more muscle on without the use of anabolics, and see what happens. You know, but I don't want to sound like I'm harping on about 
low doses because no, no, no. There's, there's a big point here about biological inter-individuality. So 50 milligram for one person could be another person's 500 milligram. And it really is that variable. It really is like the, I, like if I took, no, if Leon took what I took, right? He would look a hundred times better. You get a hundred times the result because he's a freak. He's you genetic, know? isn't he? Yeah. And if I, if I wanted to grow like Leon, I'd probably have to take 10 times more and I might die in the process. I probably just, ne- it would just never happen. You know, yeah, like, yeah. so there's just no point in me doing it. You know, you kind of do your best what you've got within your health parameters, within your own risk reward analysis. But coming to the mental health chat, like there's a lot of people that will get so, you know, right. If I take these drugs, I can be competitive with figure and it just might never be on the cards for you, no matter what you do. If your drug tolerance is such, yeah. just be realistic from day one. And these days there's a class for everybody. Just try and be really good at the one that suits you. Fucking hell. I mean, most federations now, the amount of categories you can enter, there is, like you say, there's something suitable for most people. It's also being realistic with what your expectations are coming into this sport, you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there really is a class for everyone. I was chatting to somebody the other day. They were saying they really want to compete, but they're covered in tattoos. I was like, bro, go and do muscle, that inked muscle model thing at Pure Elite. The show was sick with that I went to. Like, yeah. <laughs> You got one for you as well, you know. Like, there's literally any niche you can find. <laughs> it's a fucking class, an international model. Roll on with a suit on. I know. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Like, this is, and this is whole the whole thing with bodybuilding as well. Like, it's continuously evolving. More and more people are into it, and then you got to realize if you're going into this sport, it's much more competitive now. There's fuck loads mm. of us. So yeah. you know, especially going down the assisted route, actually getting the information first before thinking that you're going to be a bodybuilder forever and you're willing to put everything into it. Because, of course, when you start out, you're like, I will do anything. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, 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 100%. So that kind of exposure that you mentioned there on yourself, like that six weeks of about 70 milligram, and you said you're you're going to do it again. I think that probably... I mean, again, there's great biological individuality, not only to the positive anabolic effects, but also to the androgenic effects. But I think for most women, if I was forced to make a general recommendation, having two blocks of six weeks or maybe three blocks of four weeks of your year, your whole macro cycle periodized plan with 35 to 70 milligram ish. That's the normal, isn't it? For 99 percent of women, you're going to be safe and not pay virilization, assuming you're not doing it for the next 10 years. So the question then becomes, right, well, I can make progress in four week blocks then. no. That's, that's not the way that we would do it. So we've actually already gone through a load of drugs that are non-androgenic in the earlier episodes, right? So if you guys want to deep dive on that, go and look at that. But that's what we would do. We would use the anabolics only in very specific situations. For example, right at the end of a contest prep, when you need the cosmetic input, when you need to retain skeletal muscle, that's a suitable position to be in. Right at the end of a big push, when you're a very advanced competitor already, you know, you're really struggling to get muscle tissue on. Maybe for your final mesocycle, you might have some exposure in there. Yeah. The rest of the year, you should utilize drugs that are non-androgenic in consequence. Like, let's say you need this much anabolism to grow new tissue because you've been training like 10 years, you've done everything right. Like, to be honest, even in perfect conditions, you're probably not gaining two grams of muscle naturally a year anyway. Like, So yeah. let's say you need this much. And with Primo, you can do that in one. Bang, cool. But... We only get four weeks, right? So how do we get up there? Well, we've got growth hormone. We've got insulin, telmosartan, metformin, clenbuterol, injectable L-carnitine. Okay, cool. Uh, potentially that hormone replacement therapy, testosterone, is putting you above where you would normally be if yeah. you're not right at the top of the top end or something. And if needed, maybe additional estradiol or progesterone, you know, if you need a real comprehensive hormone replacement therapy protocol, and that's what we do the rest of the year. And they're all drugs that are tolerable. Maybe bar, I mean, I was going to say maybe bar clenbuterol, but that is, uh, you know, prescribed in 40 microgram a day dosages. I probably wouldn't use that concurrently anyway. But, you know, your, your growth hormone, your insulin, your testosterone, that hormone replacement therapy dosages, your injectable L-carnitine, your metformin, your telmosata, and you can use these year round, assuming you're remaining within appreciable dosages, to turn up the anabolism a little bit or turn down the catabolism a little bit, improve nutrient partitioning, improve your fuel oxidation. So maybe you're 
uh, mobilizing and oxidizing more free fatty acids and then maybe you're partitioning more glycogen into the muscle so you know these skewing all of these different metabolic pathways to create a pretty robust outcome that's non-androgenic that's where women need to put all of their focus and before you even think about anovar you know it's the standard first cycle i think about using anovar first cycle. no forget about all of that this is the stuff you've got to do first because you've got all these easy wins yeah yeah it's getting a baseline almost and like a foundation like you say that you can go through all year round exactly get yourself set up on a baseline that's really tolerable but improves outcomes of everything when you're performing low intensity activity and you've got growth hormone and injectable l-carnitine in there maybe you're him being maybe clenbuterol i forgot to mention t3 t4 you're oxidizing the loads more body fat cool well if you're like you know minica you don't need your androgens so well, you're cranking up fat loss hard with those drugs and they're non-androgenic you know no problem yeah um same thing for your growth phases if you're going to crank up more growth hormone are you going to use insulin or something like that they're both anabolic within their own right I hate to say growth hormone is anabolic. Someone's coming at me with the, it's never been shown to grow skeletal muscle. It's true on its own, I know, but it is, it is still net anabolic for sure. Um, and especially- hey, you know, when... Tom keeps saying to me, you're on more carbs than my male competitors and clients. We might need, you might be the first female that I get to use insulin with. <laughs> oh, really? Oh God, that makes me feel bad. It's like all of my female clients use insulin. Shit. I'm like, <laughs> this is quite cool. <laughs> Yeah, and, and probably a lot of people hearing this like insulin. Oh my god, that's that's so dangerous, you know. Like, but like you should never use insulin for women. That's the worst one. It's like women should never use insulin, but it's like okay, there's literally millions of diabetic women on the planet that use insulin. This is it can be managed. I mean, sure, all drugs can be dangerous. All drugs have a an LD50, a lethal dose 50, right? But the the, the LD50 of Lantus insulin, for example, is excruciatingly high, it's a thousand units. So you don't, and I mean, there's 300 units in a pen and like you'd normally dose, most of my females would use 10 units a day. So, you is know, Is that a talking, lot less than a male? Uh, maybe my males would be 20 units. Okay. I don't think I've ever had one go over 20. I know some medical guidelines would be 0.2 units per kilogram of body weight. So 50 kilo female, 10 units. It's probably analogous to what your pancreas likely produces on its own a day mm. anyway. Um, I find insulin so interesting living with Matt and seeing like the effects of it. I'm like, mm -hmm. this is wacky. Yeah. The big, the big pump. You can't, you can't compare that. I mean, it feels great and it looks great. You know, when the Atlantis is in the blood and you get the big swell, but you've got to also think, you know, more and more evidence showing us that metabolic accumulation seems to play a role in hypertrophy. And if I'm using this drug and getting this huge pump, like there has to be something there, you know? Yeah. But it's always uh, after when he's like, I have to get home and eat cereal. Like it's like uh, we have to power walk home to get home. Obviously, goes hypo. I like it. I like it. Maybe he's just using that as an excuse. Like I need to eat cereal because I'm using insulin. It's also as well, I guess, quite a valid fact that you know when you go down the PED route, you've actually got to think about you know putting time into that, putting money into that, getting some mm -hmm. you know education behind that. It's not just something really you should just dive into. And I think that. Really, that's why people just go into like Anavar. I'll just get a pot of Anavar. Don't really need to think much about it. Whereas the safe yeah. hospital, it's almost like it's more complicated, but actually what's more important, you know? Yeah, in the model we've discussed today, there's definitely more to think about. It's definitely going to be more expensive. And, and it's more definitely commitment. more confusing the first time you look at it. But please, I ask people just... To spend some time, like we've worked really hard at Physique Collective. In fact, I'll mention this now because we've yeah. just taken on a new member of staff, not been announced or launched yet. Um, this is a first. This is an ex exclusive. Oh, the radio exclusive. Voice. Um, I said you're a VIP, mate. <laughs> I do like a Tim Westwood vibe thing. Is he still a thing? I don't uh, know. <laughs> anyway, so, because I, I was planning to do a female PED series. And I've done a lot of episodes on a female PED series already. The problem that I run into is women don't want to listen to me because I'm not female. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm not there with the six-pack abs or anything that's going to attract the viewership. Um, <laughs> it's an aesthetic so, sport, mate. <laughs> so what I've done is taken one of my female mentees that I've known and worked with for years. And if somebody new, Physique Collective... You guys won't know who it is, but she's 
brilliant, extremely knowledgeable. And essentially, we're just going through a list of topics that need covered. We've already broken them all down on our calls, and she understands them all really well. So we're subcontracting out the word to her. So females watching this, that there is a, a long-form female PED series coming uh, we've got all, we've already got like the calendar lined up January, February, March, April, May, June. There's multiple videos coming out through the whole thing, and it will be the the comprehensive breakdown of female PED use. Oh, sick! And obviously, we know Physique Collective is a really reasonable price to go onto the forum. Is, is it still six ninety nine? It is still six ninety nine, but I warn people, it will be increasing. <laughs> Yeah, Only I mean, to like nine ninety nine, and people that are currently on there, don't worry, you're getting grandfathered in. I'm not increasing anybody's prices on there, but we've just got so many members of staff now with so much content coming out that it's it, it sits like this. You know, it's not a money making business, which is none of us care. You know, that's not the point of it. It's, it's meant to just be a, an educational service, but we are going to have to increase the price just subtly to pay for things like this. Yeah, know? sure. Is there? So if someone was listening to this and, you know, first timer, never been down the PD route and is quite interested in it, is this sort of framework that you're going to put out through the Physique Collective, would it be like almost an education path of each of the different compounds yeah. and how they could work together? Yeah, and it's in the order. Like I can pull it up in front of me now. We got making the decision to use PEDs, so considerations there. Good start. Risks non-androgenic versus androgenic ancillaries, what health markers do you need to monitor, and understanding the female reproductive system and female physiology. And then we move on to the drugs. We've got metformin, telosartan, growth hormone, clenbuterol, your him being T4, T3, insulin, and then they all branch off, you know, insulin and hypertrophy, endogenous versus exogenous insulin. Why use insulin? When you implement it, what's the difference between long-acting and fast-acting? You know, all of this stuff. It's awesome. uh, very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. because it's I think from my own point of view when we first spoke about me going down this route I needed to understand it from you and you really kindly helped me do that you know for your own time and that then helped me make the decision and I feel like people who don't have that access to someone like yourself it would be very hard for them to you know make that decision without the education so part of why we're doing the podcast part of why you're doing it through the physique collective forum is to offer that at least some base level tuition so people don't go down the route and then the consequences are things like virilization yeah and uh, i understand and sympathize that it's a uh, an area with a lot of noise with a lot of people saying do this someone else will say no you should do this and someone else will say no actually do this you know like, but you know the whole point of physique collective was an evidence-based format so it's we think you should do this and here's why you know and then it's research based. It's based on clinical data. Here's a drug that's approved for human use. This is what it did in these human studies, you know, studies on actual humans at these dosages for this length of time to these health markers and to this marker of hypertrophy or whatever. You know, this is everything we know about this drug. Maybe this is some of the anecdotes that people say. And then now you have to make your own decision based on evidence. Because I think that's the only thing you can give people give people evidence, let them decide what they're going to do with it. Yeah, I really loved like the time with you and you going through it with me. I really loved how I could understand it and then make the decision based on, like you say, education and knowing what's involved, you know, everything that's involved in it and then making the right decision for myself. It was such a good opportunity for me. And as you know, I'll always be thankful for that. But at least if we can get some information out there, it helps people maybe make a better decision or I, know, I don't know what you think, but if someone was listening and they're like, okay, do I go down the assisted route? What would your first port of call be if they, you know, if they maybe got a coach, but they're not sure to speak to them? You always speak to your coach, but my best recommendation would be, and I'm not trying to make this a sales thing, but in fact, use the seven day free trial, right? So they don't even have to pay. Go yeah. on for Zika and read through all of the articles that we've got on female PED use and then go to the progress logs and you'll find many competitors log in exactly what they're using. This is what they saw. This is how they do it. Here's was the good thing. Here was the bad things. Look at all of that stuff. And if you want to cancel, cool. You know, but that's the, the easiest way to, again, gather as much evidence for you to make an informed decision because that's all you can ask somebody to do to be informed about their decision. Gone are the days that a coach can say, right, here's how we do it. 
and of our own day, or it could be any drug. You know, we're going to take broken at this dose. Like, that's not the way coaching works now. You have to give people a reason why and be able to explain the fundamentals and potentially even the intricacies of the drug use that are going to maybe negatively impact the individual and let the individual decide what they're going to do. I think that's sometimes hard as well, though, isn't it? If you've got a coach and you really do respect them and then you maybe listen to a podcast like this and you're already taking Anavar and Anavar only, and you're suddenly like, shit, what do I do here? You know, this does happen in our industry, doesn't it? Yeah, the best thing you can do is just ask your coach, you know, hey, I noticed that we're only using a, a, an anabolic androgenic steroid. Um, could you just explain why? And maybe they'll have a great reason. Yeah, yeah. Maybe there will be a great reason. If they have no reason, if they reply, trust the process, run a million miles. <laughs> it should be in Primo we trust, which is on all the compact mugs. That's <laughs> right. It's like the, the physique collective saying, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's well Kirkham's favorite favorite phase in Primo is, we trust. <laughs> Kirkham definitely needs to get a t-shirt with that one. Or you know, one of them tanks he wears and it cuts the sleeves off. One of them bad boys. I can see him wearing that for sure. Oh, so is there anything else you think would be good for us to touch on before we wrap up, my friend? Because I feel like uh, we've actually covered a lot. We have. I'll quickly mention something that popped into my head when you mentioned Anova was its route of administration. So the reason why somebody would take Anova over Prima Bolan or Mastron is that you just eat it. <laughs> Yeah, it's so much easier and we said it when we did the pod with josh people and i had it at first so i was like how do i inject joe and obviously you helped me but it's like i don't know maybe as a female even more so i can't inject myself but actually it's super cool and it's safer oh it is far safer route of administration and again per milligram it is less androgenic is it going to make a great deal of difference in people that don't use moderate to high dosages for long periods Maybe not, but maybe. Depends on your biological... Look, we're only left with a best choice. You know, Why wouldn't we make the best choice? And with where injection technology is now, needle technology, needles are so thin and so you small. Don't feel it. If you look the other way, you won't have a clue. You can inject it subcutaneously, which women probably should do, which is painless, with an insulin pin. No problem. It's over in a second. And you do it a few times, normal. Normal stuff. Yeah. You know, there, there are children that pin insulin multiple times a day and are fine yeah know? also though you know like josh said when he came on he was like so you're gonna do all of this you know the sleep the training all everything that goes into being a bodybuilder but you won't inject yourself because it's deemed as like i don't know almost a bad thing but then you'll take yeah. oral steroids and he's like well you know <laughs> what do you want to do here what are you committing to being a assisted athlete you know yeah, just like anything else, you go the route that makes the most sense. You know, that still gets you to your destination, but with the least health costs possible. You know, just like training, maybe you would choose one exercise over the other because one really hurts you, but it still works. It still generates mechanical tension. Yeah, but yeah. why would you do it? Just do the other one, you know? <laughs> it's like that convincing clients not to deadlift when you're a bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah, that can be tough. Yeah, that could be a podcast alone. <laughs> Exercise selection is definitely one I still struggle with with some clients, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Managers yeah. love flat benching. I'm like, yeah, but I like your GH joint to be intact for many more years to come. So, can I just do freestanding squats, please? I love them. No. <laughs> or can I just say every set to failure? And you're like, uh... <laughs> on that note, okay. do you have coaching spaces, my friend, or are we still fairly selective of who we're going to take on? <laughs> yeah so i always i always answer this in the same way as in like i keep a really strict like range in my client list i have these like fixed clients that never ever move and then you have some that come on for prep and then dip off and then some like i've got a few clients that are like prep every two years or something like that there's always space on my books for the right person but i only work with competitors and we do have to chat quite a bit beforehand and that's not because i'm trying to only pick the best athlete or something like that or piss the best person with the best genetics with the best chance of turning pro or going to the end it's nothing like that it's mainly because i just want the best working relationship for us both 
to be able to progress together as best as possible. And I think that shines through with my clients. Well, I'm so close with so many of my clients and things like that. But it, it, it takes a lot of time crafting that. And for even sure. taking one client for me is a load of time and work. So I want to make sure that it's perfect, you know. But by all means, DM me if you're a competitor and you want to work with me, we can chat. And even if I haven't got the most suitable space for you, I guarantee I could show you the person that does after talking to you and learning your proclivities and things like that. Because you've got a team of coaches, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Physique Collective have a team of coaches. We've got... Uh, Gareth Buchan, Christian Chapman, Matt Strong and myself, we're the directors of the company. And then we have Holly Davidge, Leon Pierce and Ryan Brambleby that all coach for us. So there's going to be somebody there that you are perfectly suited to, I guarantee it. Mm -hmm, for sure. So if they want to, you know, look at any of those guys on Instagram as well, you've just read out the names, or of course, like you said, send you a DM. And if it's not suitable for you, We've got options of plenty of coaches there. And then you've got the Physique Collective Instagram as well, which is where it the font of all of it. Yep. So at Physique Collective on Instagram, you'll see all of our coaches, all of our content linked to the app. And also we have a seminar in early March. Unfortunately, by the time you guys listen to this, the early bird tickets have all sold out. So the price was raised. It was 149. It's now 199. But there's still some drips and drabs of tickets left. Everybody from Physique Collective is there. I'm presenting on planning and periodizing performance enhancing drugs for a prep for both males and females. And that's going to be a long presentation, going to be all inclusive. You know, I think £200 for a whole day of education from like eight people is like pretty good still. Oh, for sure. Like when you look at some of the things that you can, you know, sign into, it's, it's hella expensive. So again, it's an investment in your own development as an athlete or a coach yeah so guys tickets are available get them i don't know if they'll they'll still be available by the time you put this out but hopefully <laughs> they are who quick. knows and you can't dm joe to get a secret ticket because there is none <laughs> unfortunately not even my clients got that unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming on mate it's been super cool to reconnect and get you back on the pod and of course i also congratulations to you and matt don't get me in the field. You know, you know, I'm a man that likes. I like the the traditional relationship. I'm a, I'm a man about marriage. You know? I know. Yeah, I said this to Matt. I was like, "This is Joe's like, what, what's the way?" I was like, "Joe is very, very traditional when it comes to marriage." And he was like, "Is he?" I was like, "We've had some deep conversations about this being very, you know, very important." But yeah, man, like it was fucking mental. But yeah, saw on Instagram. <laughs> Super cute. He did it a lot better than me. Bear in mind, I was I was young when uh, when I proposed to Jazz. I was broke, but you know, uh, he, he did yeah, as well. Really... He was like, I told Joe, I never ever wanted to get married, but yeah. Joe was like, when you find the right person, don't tell my wife this, but you just know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully, she doesn't listen to this now. Um, Thank yeah, you, absolutely. mate. No, of course. Right, I'm off to train the dog. Enjoy your dog training. <laughs> I oh, will. Thank you for having me, Sarah. Enjoy the rest of your week. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year as well. I know. What the fuck? 2023? Let's go, my friend. Thank you, mm -hmm. mate. Of course. Speak to you soon, Sarah. See ya. Bye.